Okay, so I am really, really excited to have a family with me today that has done some absolutely amazing things, gotten incredible results for their son. And so Daniel and Emily are here, and we're going to talk about their 10-year-old son, Judah, and his experience and their journey with dyslexia. So hi, you guys. Thank you for being here. Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. Would you mind just telling us a little bit about your journey with Judah and what that looked like? Like, when did you find out that he had dyslexia? Uh, tell us a little bit about your your journey at first. Um, so we have six kids and Judah is our second oldest. Um, and our oldest son is really advanced in all of his reading and everything. So we we went into school with Judah. Um intentionally trying not to compare them um, as far as their progress or what they like to do, what they don't like to do, you know, as, as parents do with multiple kids. And even from kindergarten, he was really struggling with some of the um, letters and what sounds they would make and mixing them up. And um, that continued each year. We would bring it up to teachers um, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, even third grade. And the answer that we typically got was just like, well, that's still developmentally appropriate at this age. There are multiple kids who are still struggling with these areas. We'll keep an eye on it. Um, but, and he always, he, he did okay. Um, but he definitely was easily frustrated with homework. Homework would take a very long time. Um, we would actually, we advocated to the school multiple times for less homework or not having homework because it was taking him so long. And what we didn't realize was it was taking most of his homework was only because he didn't get things done in class. And that wasn't the adequate amount of homework for everyone. Um, nor was it taking his classmates nearly that long to get through things. And, um, we, third grades passed, we still asked questions and tried to push a little bit. And then fourth grade started and um, Judah is pretty even keeled emotionally, um, especially around other people. And in September of fourth grade, he um, got really frustrated at a teacher. And so we got this email about it and it was a big red flag to us that this was he was so frustrated that that was emotionally spilling out. Um, and so that's when we started um, looking into what we could do. And we started asking for testing. Um, we went through all the hoops to do that. And the problem when we met with the IEP team was they wanted the data to back it up. And his teachers were saying, like his teachers were in front of us saying, he cannot read without supports. Um, but we've been giving him supports as good teachers do, like they're helping him adjust and adapt and overcome. And then the school psychologist was saying things like, well, we need to have two semesters worth to show that he really needs these supports. And I, I wasn't going to do that as a mom. Sorry, we're not making this harder for him just so you have data. So we ended up, um, just really working through the backside of the system to get him a 504 in place and to get him some supports, but it, it was not enough. It was just um, very slow progress. And we really could see it when his youngest sister, um, her younger sister, our third child, she is three years younger than him. And she came into school and within a year or two was reading way back, like she would answer over his shoulder. And so we had to stop doing homework together. And um, it was it was very obvious at that point that he was really struggling in all the things. And the school was just um, as great as some of his teachers had been. They were not, he wasn't able to make the kind of progress that we wanted. So at that point, we reached out to someone here in town Um to look at some tutoring options. And we were, we talked to them, kind of went back and forth on that. Um, and Judah did not like school. Um, he did not like reading. He didn't want anything to do with that. So to look at him and say like, oh, hey, we're gonna do tutoring two nights a week for the foreseeable future. Um, it didn't, 
I don't think it would have gone over well emotionally for our family or financially for our family, anything. Um, so then I started, um, I guess probably because I had been searching and different things, different programs were coming up on, uh, on my newsfeed and I saw the 45 minute video, um, the introductional video. And I watched that, um, one night in the middle of the night and, so many things started falling into place where it just wasn't my perception of dyslexia, um, just mixing up your B's and your D's or whatnot, but other things like we've never been able to give him multi-step directions. He's always gotten very frustrated if we try to tell him do this, 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 and this. And um, all these pieces started falling into place enough. Um, we also, three of our kids, including Judah, are adopted. So we've done a lot of the research and read a lot of books about um, trauma to your brain and how, and just all the neurological impacts that trauma or anything else has and how your brain can be re, um, structured. You can get different neurons floating, like everything happening, um, with the proper steps to overcome trauma. And so then to hear that in the educational world of like, oh, this is how a brain is acting with dyslexia. This is how a brain is acting without. Here are some steps. Um, it just seemed like a video that was making a lot of sense for our context and our situation. So then I sent it to Daniel and I had him watch it. And yeah, it was one of those. I woke up at six in the morning and already had a text message from my wife. So I was like, this must be pretty important. Watch uh, this now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was in like, August or September. So the beginning of fifth grade and, um, we started, we had the phone call with Anne and then we did, um, which that was very helpful just to even have so much context and so much explanation and even just, um, descriptions of how to explain it to Judah in a way like he always wants to know why things are and what what is happening um why things are the way they are why they're not the way they are not um from spelling to the way his brain works so having that context of being able to say okay this is what's going on in your brain this is our plan what do you want to get out of this um having that guidance was really helpful to have those conversations with him and so then we decided um, to start in October after our, our fall sports were finished and he could focus on that. And I think and, we started middle of October. Yeah. Another thing that impressed me, I'm, I'm, I work in athletics. I was a three sport athlete. I think like an athlete, the coach and to have, whether it was you or Aunt, someone from the organization, look at us and say, Hey, this isn't half hearted. Like if you're going to do this, you got to right. do it. You got to commit. And that, that, that kind of fired me up. I'm like, yeah, I like that. I like that challenge. I like that intensity. And I think Judah does too. Yeah. And so going to him with that kind of mindset of, Hey, this, this isn't for everybody. This, this takes some commitment. And, and, and obviously if we're going to commit financially, we're going to commit schedule wise, we're going to mark time out of our schedule to do this. You got to be all in. And, and I think that impressed me and it gave me an extra sense of like competitive intensity. And I think for Judah did too, because Again, if we would have gone to him with no context and said, hey, guess what? For the next 120 nights, we're going to work on reading. He probably would have gone in his room and never come out. So somehow something about that whole approach was really helpful for our family, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's and really then, great feedback. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think one of the things, too, was not having it scheduled like tutoring, like a, throughout the modules consistently, which I, I really like the modules because I like understanding that I wasn't just dropping my kid off and somebody else is like, I was understanding why this was helpful, what we were going for. Um, and as a teacher that's helped me in my classroom as well with other students, but consistently in the modules, like one of the things that you would say is like, you have access to your kid. So if this is stressing them out, or if this is too much, wait. Whereas if you're paying for tutoring every week, you don't really have that in your schedule. You can't really look at this kid and say, okay, he is not feeling it right now. We're going to put this down. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back to it when he's ready. Um, and just giving him, there were, there were some nights where we were like, okay, if you don't want to do this, we're not going to do it tonight. It's okay. Cause it wasn't um, going to be beneficial. Right. If he's not in it, 
we're not going to get anywhere with it. So having the freedom to be able to say, okay, we're not putting this down forever, but we're going to take a break tonight. And then after you've slept, after you've had food, after you're not all the hormones happening when you're all, you know, fifth grade, um, we're going to come back to this. And I think that was helpful for him to know that it wasn't just something that we were forcing him to do. It was a learning curve. I would say too, it was a learning curve to figure out there were times where we needed to push through that resistance. And there are other times where we needed to acquiesce to the resistance and say, Hey, this isn't the time. So learning that learn once we got that rhythm of figuring out, Oh, he just needs to be pushed a little bit to stick with it. And then know what will lay it down. I think once we hit that point of kind of figuring that out, it really was, was more, I think the whole process kind of fell into place and it became a rhythm. It became a rhythm in our schedule. We had the big number board on the, on the wall so he could go cross out each night. And that's, Emily and Judah are wired that way. Like they like to cross things off. And, and so I think that was extra motivation as he started that, started to see that click off. And especially after, you know, after the third module or whatever it was, where I don't know if he noticed, but we started to notice improvement and we were able to show that to him. I think that's where that flywheel starts to turn and you get that momentum so that when you do head into bit of confidence, you head into some of those, but the modules are getting progressively more difficult too. So you need that momentum to push you into these more difficult modules. And I feel like the way the structure, at least for us, it seemed to work really well. That's awesome. Okay. So, I mean, you guys are talking about we, and I mean, it was clear to me that you came up with a system as a family. So would you mind just talking about like how that looked? Did you guys trade off? Did sometimes you both would work with him or how did you make this work for your family? Well, I want to point out that it was Sunday, like we had like team meeting on Sunday to watch the videos. And I told you this earlier, we weren't allowed to watch them at 1.25 speed or, or 1.5 speed. We, we had to watch every single video and every exercise at one we speed. Had to. Like like I, wanted, had to watch I didn't it want it just to be me. And then, and, and not that I was resistant to that. It was just, no, but we, we have six kids. We've got a lot going on. And there's a like, lot that we end up tag teaming and all handle or he'll handle. So for yeah. this, I wanted it to really be both of us knowing what was going on so that we could help him, um, and then when I couldn't do it, he could do it with Daniel or some, you know, some nights I was grumpy too, and I don't want to do it. So having, being able yeah. to like, let him take over, um, was, was really helpful. I think too, though, it was good for, cause Emily's an educator. I like to, I'm a learner, lifelong learner. So for us to both understand what was happening neurologically for Judah helped yeah. me. So that we're not just learning a pattern or a rhythm to repeat. We're learning the why. And so we can incorporate that even into things we're not doing inside the modules, but just like incorporate into life in general as we're communicating with Judah about things and challenges. And even I coach him in soccer. So even some of those things, as I'm thinking through, okay, he's frustrated on the field. I think this is, I think this is actually a, we're having a brain issue right now. We're having, we're having one of these issues. So even those kind of being in the know, so to speak yep. about what's happening was really good for us, even though it was a challenge. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't want to paint this as like, it's you so get easy. It, is, it was not easy. It was difficult. A lot of ways, especially when you're in the grind of it's yep. the third or fourth module, things are getting difficult and June is really having to press in and we're tired and it's winter time. We live in Illinois. There's no yep. sun. Everybody's yep. vitamin D starved and you know, it just, it gets intense. Right. Yeah. But, um, but pushing through, and having that system of like every Sunday we're going to watch these videos and we're going to we're going to stick to it and if we if we miss a night we're going to make up we're not going to get behind i think that that commitment to the process has borne itself out with and i'm sure i don't know i don't want to i don't want to get ahead of ourselves but the results That's okay i mean i mean yeah. to look at the i mean it's blown us away the, the the results that Judah has in his test scores and his proficiency and all these different things is just it makes it all more than worth it at the time. But and I, I want to plant that seed too, for people that, you know, if you've been screened and you've been, and if you guys on your team think that people are qualified and, and need to have this curriculum, I think it will pay dividends if you stick with it. And I think that's keeping that goal in mind is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. 
I appreciate you saying all of that because it, I mean, it's one of the reasons why we ask the question, like, are you committed to this process? Because it doesn't happen through osmosis. I mean, it would be lovely if it did, but that is not how this thing works. And so repetition is key and consistency is key and having a clear why, you know, like, what is the reason that you're continually showing up to do this? And if you have that clearly articulated for yourself and you're constantly talking about it and like, it's easier to show up on the days when maybe you don't want to. And I think that's with anything, like if you're doing a workout program or if you're trying to diet or whatever it is, like there are days when you inevitably do not want to do that thing, but there's got to be a more compelling reason to continue showing up. And as long as you have that and you're willing to, you know, figure it out for your family, you can do this. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's so incredibly important. So I think you're, you're giving us a perfect segue to talk about about the amazing results that he had because holy cow did he do some amazing things so i'm just gonna shoot say, out some numbers go ahead emily go ahead all right real quick before um i think it's important too that you guys had him or had us talk to him and talk about his why too because i i do feel like it wasn't just there's so many things you know as parents where we know the why and we know why this is important we got to keep working at this um but for him to articulate hey, this is what I want to get out of it. And then to remind him, hey, you're not going to get out of this unless we actually stick with it. And even just knowing one of his big goals was to be out of um, tier, uh, I want to say tier three in RTI, where he was just consistently being sent to reading um, to do more work that he already didn't want to do. And he kept saying, I want to be in, I don't know what it was, fitness or one of the other RTI things where it's a little bit more fun Um, and so then to advocate fourth quarter where he had met all of the goals to be moved into tier two, except for fluency. And we went into our parent teacher conferences and we're like, no, we we really want him. Like, this is his goal. We are comfortable. We are still working with him. Can you please move him to tier two? So he gets that little bit of a confidence boost and all this work that he's put in for the last few months has been successful. Um, and just being able to not just have our buy-in, but his buy-in was really important too. And I liked, I liked that about the program. Well, it wasn't going to happen without his buy-in. <laughs> no. I mean, it wasn't, so. Sorry, and go then, ahead. No, no, no. I mean, it's, it's such a beautiful point because I think it's a lifelong skill. Mm-hmm. We're talking about reading and spelling right now, but that is something that you carry through your whole life. And so if you want to do something for your career or if you want to achieve whatever it is, like you figure out at this tender age, like I'm going to set a goal and then I'm going to take inspired action daily in order to get myself to that place. And so I just think that that's such an incredible opportunity that you've been able to give to him and he'll be able to carry that forever. Hope so. Well, yeah, I hope so. <laughs> well, okay. So when we take a look at some of his scores, I think it's a, it's a good time to like talk about what actually happened is as it pertains to the program. But then I think it's also really great to talk about like, what did it look like in his real life and how did it show up in other places? So when we start the program, we always gather some baseline data of like, okay, what are things really looking like? And there's this assessment at the beginning where we're measuring phonological awareness. How well is the brain actually able to hear the sounds and words, pull out a part of it, put some of it back together and be able to do some of that manipulation of sound. And so he had 61% accuracy at the beginning of that. And then, you know, uh, several months later was able to move that to 88% accuracy. His reading score on the wide range achievement test five went from the 16th percentile to the 91st percentile. Holy cow. (laughs) We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, And then his spelling test went from the 13th, 13th, to the 39th percentile with additional items that were phonetically correct that, you know, maybe if he would would have just known the pattern that, you know, it's EE instead of EA, then we could have had an, you know, an even higher score, but incredible progress, statistically significant progress in all three areas. So will you just kind of take us behind the curtain of like, what did that look like for him as it pertained to his life? Like what kind of things were better because his results got better? Well, I think obviously confidence is a huge part of it. So, and that builds on itself. So the first, 
the first, he used to have these, I can't remember what they called them, but these reading comprehension homework quiz things where he'd have to read a couple paragraphs and answer questions and he would bomb them. He, he, cause, cause the kid couldn't read. I mean, he couldn't understand what he was reading. And then the first time for him to bring one of those home with an A on it and, and for him to say, and he, and then he's making the direct correlation between this isn't an accident. My teacher didn't do this for me. I've put in work and it has, it has led to success. So the, and then we're championing that and we're making that a big deal. So I think that was the point where things really started to turn that confidence built on itself. And now that, cause I think Judah had always, even if he'd never said it out loud, when, when, when his brothers and sisters are bringing home and we, you know, we, we want to champion, Emily's a teacher. We're going to champion excellence in the classroom with the caveat that not everybody's at the same place. Right. But I think for Judah to be able to excel in that realm in the way that his sisters and brothers do, it was a huge confidence boost. I think um, it, for him, you can just see it. It, it would change his demeanor and even his attitude towards school. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still not his favorite thing to do. He's, he's in fifth grade, a fifth grade boy. Yeah. But I think his attitude towards school and test, so he had ridiculously bad test anxiety. And I think I've seen a lot of that also evaporate as well. He's like, hey, I got a test tomorrow. And it's like, I, I hear this kind of, this chip in his shoulder almost about how I'm going to go get this versus shaking his boots and, and having all these supports because he can't take a test. And so all of that feeds on itself with like the skills of actually being able to read, but also the confidence of building on success and watching that build in, in that emotional resilience too, which is a huge thing that we're working on with him in other areas. Um, it all, it's all connected, right? It's all connected. Yeah. So to watch that grow has been really cool. And to watch him compete with his brother and grades yeah. has been it's been good for his brother too, right? Yeah. When Judah's bringing home, you know, better grades than his brother, is, again, we're not fostering that kind of competition, but right. you know how it is. It's yeah. fun for Judah to be able to brag a little bit after yeah. so many years of like, okay, we're going to talk about his grades apart from all the other kids so that he's not embarrassed or anything like that. For him to be able to be like, this smells like an A. Look at this. Look at this 100%. We're just going to look at this 100%, like this 100%. And it's, it was like, okay, go for it. I mean, we probably need to rein that back in now. A little overconfident. But it has been fun for him to be successful in an area that was very difficult and very emotionally draining for him. So, and emotionally draining for our yeah. family. I can tell you there were times where I'm coming home from work. And Judah and Emily have been at homework for an hour and there's no end in sight. And you do that day after day after day. And, and I, I, I try to help Emily handle a lot of the educational stuff because she speaks the language. She has a master's degree, whatever. What do I know? But I had to finally step in and I was like, I'm emailing the teachers. I'm like, we're, we're not, not, gonna do we're not doing this. Sorry. So it, it really affected our whole family in that way. And so now the burden that is lifted from the kid barely brings home homework because he's yeah. getting out of school. Yeah. And so that alone has been helpful in our, in our family dynamic. I mean, this hasn't solved every problem in our family. Okay. But I'm telling you, it's made a huge difference in our dynamic when it comes especially to schoolwork and academics. Mm -hmm. For sure. That's awesome. I really appreciate you saying that because I, I don't think that people often realize how much the whole family is truly impacted. This is not yeah. just the child who is struggling with dyslexia, who has this issue that they deal with in a silo. Like this is everybody's deal. So, I mean, like, what did that look like for you guys before? Like struggling with homework or tears or frustration? I feel or... like there's a lot of frustration, a lot of tears, a lot of, um, for Judah, sometimes when he gets triggered, it's really hard to bring him back. He spirals, yeah. He does spiral yeah. quite a bit. And so it's hard to, then all of our attention's focused on him and the other kids. We still have, you know, other kids needing homework or wanting to play or this and that. And um, he's also, he has such strong personality. And so he can keep all of us laughing. Um, but when he's upset, everybody kind of feels it and everybody um, you know, wants to encourage him or make him feel better. And sometimes the encouragement from your seven, seven year old sister is not really super helpful when she can, she's trying to help you on your own work and you yeah, know, we're almost 11. We're like, yeah, no, no. Just, no, we're not gonna, we're not gonna help. Thank you. But no, we don't need your help. So for us being able to not have to kind of police those dynamics when we're all working on homework or all working on something as a family. Um, 
it's been really, really nice for, um, yeah, just for our whole family. It's kind of been just a breath of relaxation and relief this, I would say specifically this semester, yeah. we've hardly had any drama or stress with homework or tests or anything like that because the testing that was, was huge. It was, if there was a test coming, you know, the night before it would just be an all out like emotional it was a whole deal. It was a whole deal. mess. And it's, and that's not diminishing at all that there, there is such a, an issue for so many students with taking tests. And we did have some supports put in place where you can take tests away from other people and different things to help that. But that wasn't the root of the issue. I think that was the big part is when you get to the point for me, and I want to name this too, that for me, I felt a little bit of shame when I realized I've been trying to parent Judah with the wrong tool, like the wrong toolbox, the try harder, have a better attitude, buck up, buttercup kind of mentality doesn't work if your brain's not working right. And so to have to then have that, okay, I had a moment of shame, like, oh man, I wish I would have known this, but then you do the best you can with what you got. And when you know better, you do better, right? So yeah. as we know better, it helps beyond just the academics to know, like as a dad, to empathize with my son, to try to, and now I kind of understand how it's, what's going on. And it helped to keep that in mind as we're giving instruction, as we're giving directions, as we're talking about tests and, and or homework. Even just, not even just with Judah, but like Judah or like Daniel said, with coaching or um, with me teaching college students, realizing how many people That's right. yeah. struggle with dyslexia. We had no idea how pervasive the issue was. So to be able to look at other kids and realize, okay, maybe they're not just being hard headed or whatever in practice. Maybe we need to not give multi-step directions or maybe we need to make sure we're not doing this or make sure there's different supports in place for students who um, even at the college level can't read very well. Um, so just, I think that has translated. We don't know what some of our, we still have, you know, kids who are kindergarten and preschool age. So we don't know what else we'll get into if any of our other student and our other, other kids struggle with this. But um, I think we have the tools now to be more capable parents, not only to Judah, but also to the kids that we coach or the students in our classroom or other students, our other kids in our house, like just how can we be more compassionate and more effective in guiding them into what they need to be doing? Yeah, I agree. Wow, you guys, I, 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 holy cow, I, I don't even know how to respond. That's so amazing. But I, I mean, what, what I think that you're really leaning into is this idea of empathy when I know my child. And that comes from the time that you spent. I mean, Sunday night, I, I mean, I think that's where you get a lot of that because you learned it, because you breathed it, you have the ability to now speak to it in an entirely different way that, I mean, if you would have gone to tutoring or if you would have right, done a drop off, dropping or... them off and hanging out in the waiting room or whatever, it's very different from getting into the nitty gritty of, um, and not even, I, I do feel like the program was very good at not making it seem like a deficiency, but more, this is just a different way that your brain works. And so when you can combine the ways that your brain is already overcompensating, as you called it, like a superpower, just being able to show them like, hey, your brain over here is not doing quite what most kids are, but that means over here, you're like really amazing. So if we can connect these dots, like you're in good shape versus feeling that um, shame of having to have additional supports at school or having to go to tutoring or anything like being an RTI again and again like all of those things that come along with middle school and just feeling like you're not good enough to be able to take that burden away from him a little bit and make it not seem like such a deficiency but more of just a difference and we're gonna navigate around it just like we would for any other difference that you have I think so. we also try to connect the dots too to well, for whatever reason, there's shame associated with needing help with schoolwork. But when I send my kid to batting practice or give him a, you know, I, if I get a pitching coach for my kid, it's not shameful to do that. And it's like, and Judah, because he plays sports to connect those dots and be like, well, I just can't, I'm so, I'm so mad that I can't get this. And I was like, 
well, Judah, did you get you know X, Y, Z on the soccer field the first time you tried it? No. Right. That's why we go to practice because he's a perfectionist. And so right. just being able to take some of that shame or some of that, whatever you would call that off the table to say, it is a natural and good thing to try to work at something that you're not good at. That's not a bad thing. Your brain is growing more. But, but when you're, I think when he's, when you watch your friends, or your siblings arrive at it kind of quote unquote naturally without all the work, it does you have to kind of break that apart and say, no, that's just, we all have, and, and to be honest and be vulnerable about, Hey, I struggle with this or mom struggles with yep. this. There's different things that we all need extra work at. And I think too, don't underestimate that time that we were spending with Judah. Um, there's relational things happening there. There's, there's all kinds of things happening beyond just retraining the brain for reading better. That was kind of special that we got to spend. I mean, we had our kids always had to get a lot of one-on-one -on -one time. We have sick kids. And so for, for, I think for Judah to get that consistent kind of one-on-one, -on -one, we'd send everybody else to bed and it was just us with Judah for 15, 20, 30 minutes. That was, don't, don't underestimate just the power of that relational time too. Yeah, for sure. You know, it's funny, Daniel, you're not the first person to say that. Like we had another mom who said, actually miss it. Like we didn't have any screens. Nobody was on their phone. Like That's it was just cute. us and it was just that time. And I actually right. miss it. So, I mean, I'm sure you don't go into this thinking that that's what you right. might say, but you're right when you say that it's so much more than just working on reading skills. You're teaching about growth mindset and you're teaching about the value of pursuing your dreams and meeting your goals. And you're talking about, you know, how do I show up even though I might feel unsuccessful this day, you know, how do I not write a story about that and still show up tomorrow? And so there is a lot of mindset component that comes along with it. And I think that's one thing that, you know, we really do try to put together is like, it's not just reading. Like we also have mindset yeah. coaches because it is a, a mental thing too. And we want you to understand that your brain is a superpower. You do have the ability to think creatively and laterally, and you have uh, the ability to be spatial about your thinking in ways that other people cannot. And so that's amazing. And if you continue working on the things that are hard for you, you're right when you say like, of course you can grow because everybody can grow. And so if you believe that and you know that that's true, then it, it shifts your actions and your results and all of the things. So it's just that belief cycle over and over again in a positive way. I think, I, go ahead. Sorry, I think it will serve him well for the next thing that he comes up against. That's very difficult because for, for him, so many things do come easily like athletics and different oh, things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So for him to have this example in his mind of, okay, this was really hard and this is what we did and it did get easier. I think that will build some resilience and some um, confidence for whatever else is coming at us next with child raising. <laughs> one of the, and I, one of the things I would mention just for people too, don't, don't underestimate how you as the parent will learn. So I found myself, I, I didn't learn phonics. I wasn't taught that as a kid. So I'm sitting there with Judah and then we had to like a couple of times, like, Hey, this is for Judah. Would you stop? Cause I'm like asking questions and I'm like, Hey, how'd you, we're slashing, I'm over slashing and dashing with Judah. And I'm like learning stuff. And I got really excited. And then was like, hey, this is not for you, man. Well, you were trying to answer. <laughs> oh, what you that? Well, I, I got caught up in You're the secondary. Sorry, buddy. But this is Judah's time. I'm learning. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was really good for all of us. Yeah. I think even just some of our other kids would. They would jump into yeah. yeah, we tried to kind of make it just a Judah thing so that he wouldn't get intimidated or frustrated. But some of our occasionally you would be like, okay, they can play this, this game with us. Once he knew that he could do it well enough that he wasn't going to struggle in front of them. Um, he would let them come in and do some of the manipulatives and, and do some of that. So it was fun for all of us for the most yeah. part. I love it. I love it. Well, you guys, I mean, would you say when you, when you look back on this and you think about the journey before, so I, I think I heard you say like, potentially kindergarten, but for sure, first grade, second grade, third grade. Is there anything like, as you look back at this, that you wished you would have known or that there was an intuition that, you know, like if you could advise other people that are maybe traveling the same journey and they're getting the same story of like, oh, you're going to grow out of it. Or is there something that you wished you would have known or some advice that 
would like I to think, give others now? Um, it was difficult for me because I knew how much he was struggling to understand things. And then he would get, you know, new teachers and he's had great teachers all the way throughout. And they just have such a, I mean, I understand what they're going through. They have such a, a great number of students and some students are very high and then some students are very low and he was always right in the middle. So I think at times it was almost like you guys are overreacting. He's, his grades are still fine. Like he's getting through. Um, but I didn't want, I don't, I don't really care about his grades. Like, I didn't care that his grades were fine. I wanted him to be able to understand what he was reading and to be able to be confident. And so I wish that I had known, um, maybe everything a little bit earlier, which you, you only know what you know, but just that even, even if they're okay and they're, they're hanging in there, it doesn't, that's not really what you hope for your kid. You don't want them to just survive. You I want think, them to thrive. But also, like, I would say he was hanging in there third, first grade, but it was diminishing returns. And I could see, okay, if he hangs on in first, he's not going to hang. In, so, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, those building blocks weren't there to continue. And the, the, the red flag, the final red flag for me was during COVID. When we're doing, when we're all at home, we're quarantined and we're doing work work. all the kids are doing school work from home. And I got up from the table and I went over to Emily and I looked at her. I said, he cannot read. The kid cannot read a lick. He can read a and the, he can That's read it. or he would start words and guess, but there was so much um, difficulty with understanding or getting each word out that the comprehension at that point, you're just like, okay, I worked so hard to get these 10 words. I don't even remember what the first one was. So, and then things started being much more cross-curricular where it's not just your reading grade. Yes, your yeah. social studies had this entire article and your science had this whole, and oh, guess what? In math, we're even going to have a whole paragraph before it ever asks you the question. <laughs> so I think watching the way that it was consistently, um, just, and again, like his teachers were doing great. They were supporting him as best they could, but it was just minuscule progress. And with as much as you're learning over the course of a school year and then being thrown into a new school year and a new school year, like it just wasn't fast enough. And I think that was our hesitation too with going the tutoring route was, I mean, we're just, we're looking at, he'll probably make gains, um, but are they going to be fast enough to really make any progress? Because he's quickly falling behind. It was, it was starting to really uh, accumulate quickly like a snowball going downhill. I think one of the things that I would have wanted, I wish I would have known earlier, was just this general principle of dyslexia doesn't mean one thing, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't mean Bs and Ds. It doesn't mean there, there's, a, there's such a complex even spectrum of what it looks like for kids. And so even for adults, obviously. And so I think just having that general education piece of this is what this can show up like in these different areas, even outside of academic work with the multi-step directions and things like that. Being If I would have been educated on that maybe a little bit earlier, we would have maybe picked up. Early. And I think I had every opportunity. So I've taught English, um, secondary English and then post-secondary English for 15 years. I have a master's in English. I have a master's in curriculum and instruction, um, a bachelor's in secondary education English like I I had every opportunity to take all like I took all the classes you know for all of these different things and I I feel like dyslexia was maybe touched on a few times in this class maybe a couple times in this class but it was with a wide range of here's every other possible you know thing that your students could be struggling with it was never um the per how pervasive it is right yeah, there was, was never yeah. I you could have, I think it was given just as much attention as maybe some of the more rare learning disorders or learning disabilities. And then to know that all these students that I've looked at for 15 years, you know, 20, 25% of them have struggled through this. And many of them from lower income areas who have not gotten this kind of support um, or people in foster homes who have bounced around different school, school systems and just haven't had the consistent support. Um, I, I think, gosh, I've had so much education and we barely were introduced to this at all. And so you almost realize how 
the system is so it's just set up against you. Even the best teachers who have the best education and, and sure. want the best for their students have barely been introduced to what dyslexia even is. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just really, really tragic for so many of our students, so and, many of our kids. And I think that's what set up a lot of the, un I would call it unintentional resistance yeah. from the district. Okay. I don't think it was intentional. These are good people. We know that. Of course. It. Of course. Yeah. 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 But, but that piece of now... I would just encourage parents to lovingly and gently advocate. Mm -hmm. Don't don't be the don't be the flamethrower parent. If you need but, to, but so the lovingly advocate and, and don't be afraid to educate. Yeah. Like this, and I think that was the cool part was like knowing because we're both big on like we tell our kids all the time, don't trust Google, save your sources, and like to know that this program wasn't someone that you didn't sit in your basement and come up with this on your own, yeah. right? This is <laughs> high level accredited peer-reviewed research and to have that kind of confidence when you go to places where that's a big deal like your school district to be able to advocate that's super helpful that this isn't you know some blog this is this is phd level stuff and that's really that's really helpful as you advocate mm -hmm. that's amazing well it's i mean it, it's so powerful to know that education about this is is critical and I I can't thank you enough for being willing to share this because you are contributing to the story that helps other people to realize like oh wait that's that's me too like mm -hmm. I'm I'm in the place right now where I've been two three four years of like it's going to be okay and you're not the worst one and you're still making progress but when you feel it in your in your heart to say, but this isn't the kind of progress that I know we need. And this right. isn't getting us closer to where we need to go. And we're probably not even addressing the root causes because, yep. and then at the same time, you know, you're missing out on things like it's opportunities for you to join this club or to take this class or, you know, so as you continue on in the grades, there are more and more things that you miss out on because now you're instead joining the intervention class and it's really not tailored to you and you're not really getting it exactly for the duration that you need and with the right materials and so all of the things just kind of compound to help kids to not love learning and when you can switch that and you help them to understand that like not only am I capable but my effort equaled my success and to go from the 16th percentile to yeah. the 91st percentile is just so profound because you've absolutely shifted the trajectory of how reading is going to look in his life like forever yeah. and so I, I just I, I can't give you enough credit for showing up for him for for being committed to that process for showing him what it looks like to work hard all of the things like I just I think it's incredible and I'm really grateful that we got to be part of your journey. <laughs> no, or I'm glad you came across our new speed. Yeah, I think, you know, Judah, Judah's adopted from a country in Africa, and his middle name is Muanguzi, which means champion or winner. And I think that speaks to a lot of this. Judah had to embrace this. Mm -hmm. Like, we we could cajole and push and press where we felt we needed to, but a lot of the credit goes to Judah as well for sticking to it. And he is a special kid who uh, he, he he's – He's just special. And so for him to embrace this was a huge part of it too. Yeah. He's definitely, when he, when I was telling him his results, <laughs> yeah, when we did the 16 to 90 first percentile, he was like, I'm built like that. Like he's not, <laughs> he didn't have any like, wow. He was just like, yeah, of course I did. <laughs> like, yeah. Okay. We have come We're a long about, way. We, we maybe have overcorrected here. We got we to gotta bring it back, you know. So I love it. He's yeah. I'm he's built that way. That's what he said. So, yeah. he's right there. I'm built like that. Yeah. He's just um I I do think that it will serve him well for many years to come. Um and we're we're very grateful. Yeah, super grateful. Yeah. Well, you guys, I, I again, I, I thank you sincerely for being here, for inspiring others, for telling your story, for, you know, putting hope in a situation where, you know, I think sometimes there isn't any people feel like, gosh, you know, I, I found this diagnosis or I realized that this is happening for my kid. And, you know, then you start to get worried, like, is it ever going to get better? And can I even do anything about this? But we're not saying it's easy. It's definitely not osmosis, no. you know, like put out your hands and it's going to come to you like you do have right. to work for it but it is it is doable and you can make it happen and so I think that's just 
a super powerful testament to hear from two beautiful human beings that is in fact possible and yeah and the incredible things that happen because and of we're it. always up for sharing if anybody has questions or needs encouragement like we we do believe that it was beneficial and worth every penny that we put into it um I think one final thing I'll say is the community that opens up yeah. when you, because we're not, we're, we're very transparent people. <laughs> and so when people, we were very open about our story and you find that community, like people that maybe we didn't know their kids struggles with this or adults that I knew through my work. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I'm dyslexic. And this is what, and they're successful. So being saying, Judah, look, look, this, you put the work in and you can be successful. I think the communal aspect of aspect is important too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure. Well, thank you both sincerely for taking your time to be here. And um, again, we're super, super grateful that we got to be part of your story. Thank, thank you. you. We're grateful to you guys. Thank you.